Welcome to this A plus 1201 practice quiz. My name is Matt and I help take people who have never looked at anything related to the IT industry before. They have no idea about any of the content involved in their A plus certifications and I help them pass. This person says my notes help them pass their test. This person says they passed and now they're moving on to their network plus. This person says uh, that my resources helped them pass their A plus, their core one exam, the new one, the 1201 that came out. And all these people say pretty similar things. So with that being said, this practice quiz is if you put your effort in and you follow the content on my YouTube channel consistently, you'll end up just like these people too and you'll have that A plus in no time. So this quiz is gonna have practice questions from every exam objective, one from 1.1, one from uh, two, one from three, one from four, one from five. That's what I'm trying to say. Every one of the main ones. <laughs> you get what I'm trying to say, right? So let's get straight into it with the first question. The first question reads, at Tech Innovations, employees use their personal smartphones and tablets for work purposes. The IT department implements a management solution that secures corporate email, documents, and internal applications by containerizing these corporate resources. This approach allows employees to retain full control over their personal data and apps, while IT enforces strict security policies only on the work-related portion of the device. Which device ownership model best describes this scenario? A, corporate owned, B, FMS or free market system, C, BYOD or D, containerized security solution, otherwise known as CSS. Pause the video if you need more time to figure out the answer to this question. Your answer is coming in three, two, one, now, the answer is bring your own device, guys. The key was it actually specified that these individuals, if we go back and read the question, it says they use their personal smartphones and tablets for work purposes. So in relation to your exam, you need to know about two different methods and the pros and cons for each one. One is bring your own device. This is where people are bringing their own personal device, just like this guy here. He's bringing his own personal device into work and he's using that for work purposes. Here, the work does not want to control all of the data on that device because there's some of his personal stuff as well, but what they do want to do is kind of take the work-related aspects, put them in what's called a container and control those aspects of the device. Control only the company or work-related data applications, etc. This is good for the company because they don't have to actually pay for these workers to get given new devices that are completely owned by the company. So it's a little more cost effective, um, but there is that aspect that uh, there's some security concerns because you are now mixing work with private data. And if that individual is taking that laptop home and using it for personal use as well, there's a potential for some additional human made errors there, right? So that is something to be aware of. Essentially, it's more cost effective. It's a lot more convenient for the employees, but there may be some additional risks when it comes to like cybersecurity issues, particularly if the user themselves makes a mistake when mixing their personal data with their work data and, and just does something a little bit silly, right? And the other thing you need to know about is corporate owned, which is here, right? So corporate owned is the opposite. The corporation, the company gives out a device that they own, they control everything. They have complete security over everything. And what that means is, it's gonna cost a little, a lot more because they're going to have to actually pay for and distribute a device for every employee, but they have complete control over that. So they don't need to focus on separating the work components and putting them in a container and leaving the rest of it. Now they can just control everything. So that is the two you need to know for your assessment. The information I just gave you for your A plus 1201 exam should be more than enough to get you through questions relating to this. The next question, from exam objective two reads, an organization implements an internet appliance that integrates multiple security functions, including firewall protection, intrusion detection, antivirus scanning, and content filtering. This device helps safeguard the network by providing a comprehensive security solution in a single package. Which internet appliance is being described? A, a load balancer, B, a UTM, C, a proxy server, or D, a spam gateway. Pause the video. If you need more time, your answer coming in three, two, one. Here we go. It is, drum roll, UTM, otherwise known as Unified Threat 
management. Pause to read through this if you want, but we're going to go through it one by one. So a unified threat management or UTM is basically an appliance that integrates multiple security functions. So it's kind of like this Spartan guy over here, right? He's charging into war. He just needs his two swords. He can handle it himself. He's got the armor. He's got the swords. He's got the spirit. He's got the skills. He's got everything it takes to win that fight all by himself. It's all built into him. Whereas the other options we'll have a look at now, a load balancer is something that distributes that network traffic evenly, right? So you're making sure that you're not overloading any particular servers. As you get traffic, you're going to distribute that traffic to servers and, and you're going to attempt to keep the traffic going to the servers even. That way, you're not sending all traffic to one server and that, tra that server then won't get overloaded. So a load balancer distributes that network traffic evenly in order to optimize that performance. The next option was a proxy server. So this photo over here, guy's got a mask on his face. We don't know who he is. Is his name Bob? Is it a woman? Is her name um, Rafaela? I don't know because I don't know his identity. A proxy server does kind of the same thing. So a proxy server, as it states here, acts as an intermediary between users and external networks. What that means is you might have your user and they will send data not to their final destination. They'll first send it to a proxy server and that proxy server will then send that data on their behalf. So the person receiving that data is going to see the IP address of the proxy server, not the IP address of the person who originally sent that data. So it masks their true identity. There are other purposes of a proxy server. It does a lot of other cool things as well but we're not gonna go into that in full detail here. I do have the video covering this entire exam objective on my YouTube channel if you wanna check that out. The other option was a spam gateway. Spam gateway acts like this woman, right? It's trying to disattain or trying to discern, sorry, what is spam and what is not spam. It solely focuses on making sure you don't get any unwanted emails, right? Protecting you from phishing and things like that. So that is a spam gateway is protecting you from spam email. That's its only certification. Sorry, that's its only purpose is what I meant to say. So hopefully that made sense. Go back, rewind if you need to focus up on that again. But the next question we're gonna get into now, exam objective three. This reads, which of the following can you not configure in the BIOS slash UFE? A, disable USB ports. B, which drives the device attempts to boot from and in what order? C, blocking internet access, or D, enabling or disabling the TPM. That's a tricky one. You're gonna have to know what a BIOS slash UFE is in order to answer this question. Your answer coming in three, two, one. Here we go. It is C, blocking internet access. So basically guys, the BIOS or UFE is operating at the hardware level. It's not at this, the operating system level. It's focusing on your devices, on your computer's key hardware components. So what you can do, just a few examples, you can disable all USB ports. You might want to do this on the BIOS or UFE because sometimes people are silly. They'll find a lost USB stick, pick it up, stick it in. It's got malware. Now, congratulations, hackers have access to your bank account and they've just purchased a mansion in the Bahamas. We don't want that. So you can disable those USB ports in the BIOS or UFE, uh, which drives the device attempts to boot from and in what order. You can adjust the boot order in the BIOS slash UEFI. In your troubleshooting component of the exam, you'll get a question asking you what to do if you get a message when your computer's trying to boot up and it says, no, uh, we could not find an operating system or we could not find a drive to boot from. You may need to adjust the boot order in the BIOS in order to fix that problem and you can enable or disable the TPM, otherwise known as the Trusted Platform Module, which is basically a hardware feature that focuses on encryption on your device. You can turn that off, all right? But when it comes to blocking internet access, generally that's managed by the operating system itself, all right? You, you generally wanna look at the firewall in order to do that, okay? You might block the internet port or block the protocol altogether. Now. With that being said, we're gonna move on to, I've just gone through this, haven't I? I got a little bit ahead of myself. You can read this and this, but this is everything I just talked about before. Pause and read if you want to. We're gonna get on to 
the question from exam objective four for your exam. And it reads, James is setting up multiple virtual machines on a single physical server. To efficiently manage these VMs, he uses specialized software that allows them to run independently while sharing system resources. This software ensures that each VM or virtual machine remains isolated, optimizes performance, and controls hardware allocation across virtual environments. What software is James using? Or in other words, what software is being described here? A, AMD V, B, EXT Tech, C, Hypervisor, or D, Digitizer? You're gonna have to know what a few of these things are off by heart to successfully answer this question. Hopefully you do guys. If you don't, it's so right. I'm gonna tell you about it, but just make an attempt at the question first. So. Pause the video, make an attempt. Your answer coming in three, in two, in one. It is C, the hypervisor. So pause and read that if you want to, guys, but I'm gonna go through it one by one. I forgot last time, I'm not gonna forget this time. Essentially, guys, the hypervisor is the software that creates and runs virtual machines. It manages the allocation of resources, making sure that the virtual machine is getting the resources it needs and doesn't exceed the resources you set for it. So that way you can actually not use all of your computer's resources there. So you can set the limits on what resources your virtual machine gets. In order to do that, you need to use a hypervisor, okay? In short, hypervisor is the software used to run and manage virtual machines. You need to know a little bit more about that for your exam. You also need to know that you have a type one hypervisor and a type two. And it sounds intimidating, but really the difference is quite simple. Type one hypervisor does not have an operating system. The hypervisor runs directly on top of the hardware, whereas type two has an operating system and the hypervisor is running on top of that operating system. So a practical, application of these type one might be in a server environment where you don't really need an operating system to run that hypervisor because you don't have someone that's trying to log into windows it, it's more of a i guess a scalable like enterprise type environment whereas type two you might have your own windows device an operating system on your personal computer and you want to install a hypervisor so that you can run a mac based virtual machine on that windows device because you want to use Final Cut Pro, for example, which is a Mac only program. So think of type one, simply no operating system, whereas type two, it is running on top of an operating system. All right, the other options there, we also need to know about AMDV is essentially the component of AMD, which is one of the two main processor variants that you need to know about for your exam. AMD CPUs, can only use virtual machines if they have something called AMDV. So if you have an AMD processor, before you go and get excited about virtual machines, you need to check that AMDV uh, is enabled for that CPU. Otherwise, you're simply not going to be able to meet the minimum requirements to run that virtual machine. So you need to know about that. EXT Tech, I made this up. Gibberish, absolute nonsense. And D, a digitizer is a completely separate thing. This is the hardware input device that converts your touches. When you're touching a screen, it actually converts that into input the computer understands. So basically, in order to use a touch screen, you need to have a digitizer there to convert that touch into signals the computer understands. So digitizer lets you use a touch screen. Finally, guys, the last question from exam objective five, it reads, Sophia has been working on a project when her design software crashes unexpectedly. She notices that this has been happening frequently, especially when working on large files. Which of the following is the most likely cause of Sophia's application crashes? A, a failing network connection disrupting online services. B, a damaged monitor cable preventing visual output, C, insufficient system resources, or D, a corrupted mouse driver affecting input functionality. Pause the video if you need some time, but your answer's coming in three, in two, in one. Here we go, it is insufficient system resources. So pause and read this if you want, guys, but again, 
We'll go through it one by one. Let's look at the question and go through the answers one by one. A said a failing network connection disrupting online services that would not cause an application to crash. If you were trying to download or upload something that would cause an issue. Or if you are working with a design software as she is that was trying to access files that were located on the internet, then that would stop that from working, but it wouldn't cause the application to crash necessarily. Okay. B, a damaged monitor cable preventing visual output. That just means your monitor cable is damaged so you can't see the screen. This said nothing about her not being able to see. It was saying her application was crashing. C, insufficient system resources. Generally, if your computer needs access to resources that it doesn't have, generally it could be RAM, for example, then that application may very well crash because it just doesn't have what it needs in order to run effectively. And it's specified here that she's working with large files, which implies it's okay on small files, but when it gets to a certain size, it's too much and now it crashes. So this is a logical, whoops, this is a logical response here. It's likely insufficient system resources, likely insufficient RAM. Option D, a corrupted mouse driver affecting input functional functionality. That would mean your mouse isn't working. Nothing was said about that here. So two of these, both D and B, could be eliminated just because they don't make sense. Then you've got a 50-50 chance between A and C. So just read the options in question carefully, and a lot of the time that'll be enough to, to kind of get you through. Now look guys, if you're enjoying this, these are snippets from my learning guide. Remember at the very start, if I go all the way back here where these people were saying, I helped them pass, uh, they passed, now they're doing the Network Plus, I passed my 1201 today, can't wait to move on to the 1202, and all these people are saying amazing stuff. Uh, that's all basically from my, if I come back to where I was, my learning guide. So with this, you get notes and practice questions broken down by exam objective. So. You also get 11 performance-based questions in total. You get three practice exams and you get a tracking spreadsheet to make sure you're on track. You also get some videos that show you how to particularly complete multiple choice questions. You get videos showing how to use AI to learn much faster, much more effectively, and videos showing you specifically how to study using multiple choice questions as well. So. This is what people are saying. They're saying, I've paid for your 1102 and 1101 courses and they've helped me pass my Comptia A+. Your effort has been a great help to me. I'd happily pay for your other things. So people are actually finding this is helping them pass, which is what I'm hoping to do for you. And again, you don't have to buy this stuff to pass. This is just like if you want that extra step up. I put heaps of free resources on my YouTube channel, but if you, if you want that extra step up, this is an option to you. This one says, your learning guide is goated. I don't comment a lot, but it definitely helps with organized information and helps me piece things together more easily. Thank you so much. This one says, I downloaded your learning guide already. I can see it will help immensely with studying. I tried other popular resources, but struggled absorbing the material. This one is the website. <laughs> this is where you go to get it. If you are interested in this, you can head to journeydecyber.com slash 1201. The link is also in the description. The link is also in the pinned comment below. But again, guys, heaps of free resources on YouTube. I'm putting one of these out every single week for all of the, uh, for the 1201 and shortly for the 1202 as well. Then I'll do Network Plus, then I'll do Security Plus. So if you want to pass just like these people said I help them pass then you're in the right place just stick with me I'll get you through it all right I'll see you in the next one guys bye